church and welcome to Woodville. If you're ready to praise Jesus, why don't you stand your feet with us and let's give God some praise this morning. Come on. To your eyes makes my heart come alive. Suddenly brought to life when I met you. Reaching beyond the skies, running deep, stretching wide. Perfect life realized here with you. Come on, you sing it out with us. This love is for real, you will never let go. Are you guys excited to be here this morning? Yes. Oh, come on now. Are you excited? Yes. We're believing for a great morning in His presence. Amen. Thank you, Father. We're here to worship you, Lord. To sing of your great love, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. You stood outside of my Come, you say, my 
church this is what he does he turns it around the impossible the things we think we can't can't take on our own he comes and he turns them around thank you father we're believing for miracles this morning church amen Father, we believe in you, Lord, and all that you do, God, the love you have for us, Lord. Thank you, Father. We're going to teach you a new song this morning. When I, when I pick songs to do corporately as a church, I, I really take it seriously. I really look to God to really download into me what songs we should be doing for this season for our church. I try to remove my own personal preference and, and just try to listen to the Spirit and have Him guide me what songs to sing. And this is one song that's been on my heart for quite a while. To be honest, I was a little skeptical at first just because there's quite a bit of words in this song. And I usually kind of steer clear of some of those ones. But um, this song, I just couldn't, couldn't get it out of my spirit. It's a, it's a true declaration of who our God is. It actually speaks of the Trinity. Each verse, kind of the first verse talks about God, the second about Jesus, and the third about the Holy Spirit. There's a fourth verse that just talks about Christ coming back for us. It's a powerful song, a po powerful just declaration of the greatness of our God. And the chorus, you'll, you'll know it. It's a bit of a different tune, but you know the words. And it just, it's a true response to the greatness of our God with us just giving Him praise. So the words will be on the screen. You'll, you'll pick it up pretty quick. I just pray that this song will do to you what it's done to me, okay? Come on. Behold. The Father's heart, the mystery He lavishes on us. And as deep cries out to deep, how desperately He wants us. And the things of earth stand next to like a candle to the sun the unfailing Father will compares to His great love Behold His 
series called Revolution. And we've been reminded that the word revolution means a sudden change or a sudden shift in a culture or in a society. And we've been taking January now into February, two months to explore what God would want to say to us about our culture as a church shifting to become more aligned with what he would say on the theme of serving. And so I want you to pull out your sermon notes. They are on the back of your bulletin, or you can pull them up on your handheld device and go to our church website. We have Wi-Fi in the building. I have, look this way, a gift for every single person in this place today. Isn't that great? It's not chocolate. It's actually better than chocolate. And actually, the gift is not from me. I have to be honest with you. I didn't buy this gift. It's not from me. This gift is actually from God. Isn't that neat? Gift from God for you. In fact, you already have the gift. And it's already, if you're a follower of Jesus, in you. And this morning, what we want to do is unwrap the gift that is already inside of us. And what I have inside of this wrapping paper is my Bible. 
And so I want, yeah, come on, pretty good. Not bad, eh? I know, I know, not as good as last Sunday. Wasn't that fun last Sunday as we did the parable of the Good Samaritan? I had people come up to me after the service and said, Pastor, good luck topping that one. And uh, we had great, we voluntold some people. The only two people that I prepared in advance was Pastor Kyle and Pastor Matt, because I knew they had tough jobs. But uh, you guys rocked, and we had lots of fun. If you aren't, come on, thank them again. They did absolutely amazing. <laughs> and if you weren't here last Sunday or any Sunday you missed, pull up the sermons online. They are all archived. So we want to unwrap some gifts this morning. In fact, spiritual gifts. Why don't you look at your notes? You'll see a definition. A spiritual gift is a special ability given by the Holy Spirit to every believer. That means you. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's a spiritual gift that has been given by the Spirit to you to be used to minister to others and therefore build up the body of Christ. Now, there's a big difference between natural abilities and spiritual abilities. When you were born, everybody's born with some type of natural ability. One of my natural abilities is not mechanics. You don't want me fixing your car. Do not give me a wrench. I will ruin your engine. It will cost you a lot more money. I have giftings, but that's not one of them. Some of you are amazing cooks. You've got the gift of cooking. Um, some people said to me, Mark, there's some people, they got the gift of gab. Okay, whatever. And uh, there's different natural abilities. But when you become a follower of Jesus, Holy Spirit takes residence in your life, and the super can come to the natural, and it becomes supernatural. And there are spiritual gifts that are inside of every follower of Jesus Christ. You've got at least one gift, probably more than one. And many people go, I, I have no clue what this is. I don't know my spirit gift. I want to explore that theme today. Here's some ground rules. Number one, we as a church must not, shall not, will never not elevate any gift above another. Sometimes people go, well, that gift is more spiritual than that gift, and my gift is greater than your gift. That person gave a prophetic word. They must be really big and great. No, no gift is more spiritual or less spiritual. Amen? amen. Come on, amen. amen. We don't want to be a church that elevates gifts. We want to see all gifts equal plane, equally spiritual. Another ground rule is we never want to be a church that projects gifts. Why can't you be like me? Why can't you have the gift that I have? And everybody must have my gift. We must all be the same. Do not project your gift on everybody. By the way, the Spirit decided what gift you would get. The Spirit's the one who gave you the gift. We don't want to project the gift. So we don't want to elevate, number one. Number two, we don't want to project the gift. But here's the biggie. I don't want us to be a church that rejects the spiritual gifts. That really makes me nervous. I mean, people, they reject spiritual gifts, and they ignore them. They pretend they're not there. Here's the deal. Unused gift equals unmet need. In other words, the gifts that are in you, if you're a follower of Jesus, must come to life. They're dormant. I believe God wants to fan them to life. And he wants all the gifts to be in operation because an unused gift equals an unmet need. I meet people that come to church go, oh, my need wasn't met. Pastor, meet my need. No, everybody has to be used by God and our giftings must be in operation. And when all the gifts are in operation, look out. God's going to do some pretty cool things. If you're ready for God's word, say ready. ready. Come on, if you're ready for God's word, say ready. ready. I'm going to walk you through some teaching this morning. Lots of scripture. I mean, I hope it's okay with you. We kind of we take our messages from the Bible. Is that all right? And uh, we like to let the Bible speak to us. We want the pages of God's word. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. Here's an amazing, cool verse. Now, before I read it, Paul wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to a church called Corinth. It's a verse for a church. Verse 7. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Paul said to the church in Corinth, church of Corinth, you do not lack any spiritual gifts. I believe what God would say to you and I as a church called Woodville, we do not lack any spiritual gifts. The gifts that God wants for this place to move forward 
are already in this house. We are not going to pray that God would give us the gifts. We're going to pray that the gifts that are already here would come to life. Amen? Come on, that's pretty cool when you think about it. We're not going to pray that God would give us the gifts. We're going to pray that the gifts that are already here would come to life. We are not lacking any gift that God wants. God wants the gifts that are here to come to life. Come on, little audience participation. Amen? Amen? So let that verse just sink into your heart. Now come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to give you some foundational teaching and I believe that these verses are going to really come to life. Verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So before I read verse 4, 5, 6, 7, let me read verse 1, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Paul said, now, everybody say now, about the, spiritual, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Paul wanted to give some teaching on spiritual gifts. That's what I want to do today. I want us to explore spiritual gifts. Come now to verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts. There are different kinds of gifts. Now, the Greek word for gifts, here it is, is charismata. Everybody say charismata. One, two, three. Charismata. You know that we get the word charismatic. In fact, from the same word, charismata, you get another Greek word from which we get the word grace. And uh, charos, grace. But here it is, charismata. Paul said there's different kinds of charismata or gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. So here's the question to make sure you're awake. It's not a tough question. Who distributes the charismata? Shout it out. The spirit. Uh, some of you are asleep. You didn't get it. You ready? Who gives the charismata the spirit? Come on. Who gives the charismata? The spirit. So it starts with the spirit, and the spirit distributes the charismata. The spirit determines what gift he will put in you when you become a follower of Jesus Christ. Now stay with me. There are different kinds of charismatic gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. Who distributes them? The spirit. Look at verse 5. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Underline the word service. The Greek word for service is diakonos, and we get the word ministry, service. Service is S-E-R-V-I-C-E, -E, not S-E-R-V hyphen U-S. Now stay with me. Serve us or serve us. The gifts are not for you. The gifts are for others. The charismatic gifts are in you by the Spirit. We learn that in verse 4. And if you're tracking with me, verse 5, Paul said there are different kinds of diakonos or ministry. So here's the connection. The ministry flows from the charismata, the gifts. The ministry that God has you for you is an outcome of the charismata that he's put in you and is put in you by the Spirit. And so what God wants us to do is have a ministry that functions from our spirit gifting. Isn't that cool? God doesn't want you to do what he's not called you to do or gifted you to do. He has supernaturally put a charismata in you and our diakonos must flow from the charismata which comes from the Spirit. Now, I'm going to connect it a little farther. Let's come to the next verse. Let's come to verse number 6. In verse number 6, there are different kinds of working. Now, verse 4, different kinds of gifts. Verse 5, different kinds of service. Verse 6, different kinds of working. We've learned that gifts is the charismata. We've learned that service is the diakonos. And we've learned that the diakonos means the ministry, and it flows from the charismata, which comes from the Spirit. Now, the Greek word for working, and I'm not going to pronounce it right. I'm honestly not Greek. I don't speak Greek well. I took Greek in Bible college. I love Greek salad. I love the Greek food. But uh, I, to the best of my ability, energima, energima. We get the word energy. But I started to study that word a little more. And, and most, in fact, all the Bible scholars that I read this week said that a better rendition or translation of energema is, is, is not what you see in our text here in the New International Version. It's not working. It's different kinds of benefits 
or different kinds of results. Benefits or results. Energema. So stay with me. The energema comes from the diakonos, which flows from the charismata, which comes from the spirit. Let's work it the other way. Holy Spirit puts inside of you, when you're a follower of Christ, a charismata. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got a charismata inside of you. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say that. you got a charismata inside of you. Spirit puts the gift in you. And the Spirit who puts the gift in you from the gift that's in you, when you function in that gift, flows the diakonos, the ministry. And so when the Spirit puts the charismata in you, and the diakonos flows from the charismata, energema happens, which means results. Now here it is. I couldn't wait to tell you this. If we want God results, energema, we've got a function in the ministry that comes from the charismata, which comes from the Spirit. Are you with me this morning? Come on, that's powerful stuff. Verse 4, verse 5, and verse 6 are in chronological order. Now here it is. Holy Spirit has already put a charismata inside of you. So we need to discover what that charismata is, and we need to pray that that charismata would not be dormant, and we need to equip you so that your diakonos flows from your charismata so that we can have God results. How many people want Mark's results? Please don't lift up your hand. How many people now want God's results? Come on, lift up your hand. Come on, give a clap offering of praise to the Lord. How many people want God's results? I want you to look at verse number seven. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So there's the foundational introductory teaching. The Spirit gives the charismatic, which leads to the diakonos, which leads to the energema. And the energema is the results that God wants that flows from the charismata, which leads to the diakonos. You some of you are going, wow, that's deep. But I'm telling you, when you connect those verses and you allow the Holy Spirit to bring it to life, This church will never again be the same. Come on, are you with me today, Woodville? We will never again be the same. We're going to step into our God destiny. So I want to unwrap the spirit gifts, the charismatic. I want to break into three components. Number one, I want to very quickly talk to you about the ministry gifts. Write that in your notes. Number one, the ministry gifts. And I'm just going to give you a really brief review from Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. We've actually explored these verses, but I think I need to remind you of it. And I need the reminder, the ministry gifts, Ephesians 4, 11 and verse 12. Look at verse 11. It's on the screen. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. And if you were here that Sunday that we explored it, I, I gave you a transliteration from the original Greek. In other words, a direct translation from the original language. I I preach from the New International Version. It's a great version, like many other translations are. Sometimes they miss the original. And I'm going to give you, to the best of my ability, a transliteration from the original Greek. Verse 11. I hope it's on the screen. It actually should read, so Christ himself gave some to be apostles. Everybody say the word some. One, two, three. Some. Christ gave some to be apostles, that's what we read there, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, here it is, some to be shepherds and teachers. We learned a few weeks ago that the original doesn't say pastors, it says shepherd. I am a shepherd. If you want to know what my ministry greatest gifting is, I'm a shepherd. I'm, the Greek word is poimen. And so it says some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and then it connects the last two, some pastors and teachers. Pastor, teacher, connect together. Now, some people look at me and go, well, Mark, should we go around calling people apostle, you know, apostle Marvin and prophet Kyle and pastor Mark and and evangelist Shelley? I, I honestly am not caught up in a title. I'm more concerned about a function. I'm not, I'm not rocked by a title, but I'm more concerned about a function. I graduated from Bible College in 1985. Two years after full-time ministry was ordained, got my reverend title. I am Reverend Mark Scar. Please do not. When you walk out this morning, say, see you later, Rev. I don't want you to call me that. Some call me Pastor Mark. Some call me Pastor Scar. Some call me Mark. Some of the pastors come in, and they lower their voice, and they say, morning, Bishop. 
do not call me bishop. I, but the function is what matters. Apostle, apostolos, is the Greek word. And Paul was an apostle. Now, the E words we learned that the, apostle, the, the apostolic anointing or the apostle establishes the church. They're groundbreakers. They're pioneering spirit. They start what wasn't. They go where they've never gone before. They begin what has not yet been seen. They've got this groundbreaking establishing role. That is the apostle. The prophet enlightens the church. The prophet speaks a prophetic word and brings a voice from heaven that speaks God into a house. And it looks to the future and it sees things in the spirit realm, the prophetic. The apostle establishes the prophet enlightens and then what we learn here is that the evangelist enlarges the church one of my bible college classmates my second year came from Shawville, quebec he's an evangelist there's an anointing of god over him like you've never seen before people get saved like you wouldn't believe and some function more as an evangelist and the church is enlarged but then the shepherd teacher the poiment now here's something about shepherds in those days, shepherds left the village, moved to the country, lived with the sheep, and gave their life as a shepherd. A shepherd's role in Bible's days wasn't show up and leave. A shepherd's role was to show up and stay. I studied that in the last few weeks, and I felt the Lord remind me of the power of longevity. 1985, when I graduated, I'm going I'm to ask you a question, and, and guys that were in first service, don't shout it out. Don't, don't ruin it, all right? When I started the ministry as a youth pastor, the average stay of a youth pastor in the Western Ontario District of the Pentecostal Sims of Canada, how long do you think it was? Just shout it out. What do you think the average stay of a youth pastor in a Pentecostal church, Western Ontario, 1985? What do you think? How long? How long? Four years? Five years? Nine months. Nine months. Youth pastor would go to a church. Nine months later, go for the bigger, better deal. Another guy, gal show up. Bigger, better deal. It was messy, and it wasn't right. Spirit of God has been stirring pastors because when you read the Scripture, Paul was an apostle, and he was a groundbreaker. But in the early days, pastors would come, poimens would show up, shepherds would come and stay and give their life. And I only want to, I'm not, I'm not setting you up for a resignation, so don't get worried. I honestly am not. I'm actually trying to tell you what the Spirit of God is saying to me. In 2001, when we showed up, we're now in our 18th year here. I can't even begin to tell you the blessings of longevity. And the longer we stay, the more results we see. We're beginning to realize that the poiment anointing, the shepherd anointing, is a call of longevity. And when you live out who you are, God takes by his spirit the charismata and he releases the diakonos and it brings the energema and we get God results. I can't begin to tell you the blessing of longevity and I just give God the glory and the honor and the praise. I do. The apostle establishes. The prophet enlightens. The evangelist enlarges. The shepherd and teacher enriches the poiman. And then we learn in verse number 12 that the role is to equip his people for works of service, works of service, diakonos. And we learn that the Greek word for equip, I don't remember what it is in Greek, but I remember what it means. It means to mend. It means to, 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 to mend together. And it was the same Greek word that was used for disciples when they were fishermen before they were called into ministry. In fact, James and John, when they were called into ministry, were mending their nets. And so a fisherman would fish all night in those days. They didn't get up at five in the morning and fish. They'd fish all night. And then they, they, before they went to bed in the day, they'd mend their nets. They, they'd prepare what was broken. They'd sew it back together. And they'd clean out the guck of the fish, sorry. And they would get it ready. And they wouldn't clean their net, mend their net to put it on the shelf for storage. They would mend their net so it could be used for fishing that night. And Paul picks up that same Greek word. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd teacher 
must spend their energies equipping the people for the diakonos of ministry. Now, now, when I connect those verses with Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 12, verse, verse 4 to 7, and I'm reminded that Spirit puts the charismata in us, and the charismata leads to our diakonos, and when the diakonos is released, it leads to the energema, the God result. I think as your pastor and as your pastoral team, we better get real serious about preparing you for your diakonos so we can have the God energema. We need to pray that the gift that's already in you would not stay dormant, but would come to life and be, now I'm preaching, and be released in Jesus' name. Come on. Rick Warren, Saddleback Church, Orange County, California, I believe it is. He was only just a few years from the journey, and his church had grown to 500 people. And I'm going to tell you what brought the explosion of growth in his church is he started to study Ephesians 4, and he felt God say to him, we got to change the way we do ministry. And he got up and he preached from Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And he said to the church, I'm tired I'm doing stuff I shouldn't be doing. I need to prepare you for the works of the ministry. And he said, I'm going to make a deal with you, church. You do the ministry. I will feed you as your shepherd, give you what I feel God wants me to give you, and I will prepare you for the works of ministry. And they literally shook hands. And after they shook hands, the church exploded in growth. So here's the way I look at it. If I don't do what the scripture says, I am a bottleneck to what God wants to do in and through this church. I don't want to be a bottleneck for what God wants to do. I want to be a releaser for what God wants to do. There's, there's a charismata in you that the Spirit placed in you. And it leads to your diakonos. And when your diakonos flows from your charismata, which comes from the Spirit, there's going to be an energema. There's going to be a God result. So you need to pray that your pastor doesn't just preach a message, but he gets real serious about mending the nets. Come on, somebody give a little shout of praise in this place today. All right. Let me take you to number two real quickly. Number two. I want to talk to you, number two, for a few moments about the motivational gifts the motivational gifts. Now, I want to remind you, we don't elevate gifts, we don't project gifts, and we don't reject gifts, right? We're not saying this is more spiritual, that's less spiritual. We don't project them, and we don't want to reject them. And we've learned that unused gift equals unmet need. And we understand they all come from the Spirit, and the Spirit decides what we get. And we've learned some great truths this morning. So let me read to you from Romans chapter 12, verse 5 down to verse 8. And if you're still awake, shout amen. amen. If the person beside you didn't say a word, elbow them in the side in the name of Jesus. Romans chapter 12, verse 5, down to verse 8. Let me read it to you. So in Christ, everybody say in Christ. One, two, three. In Christ. We though many form one body. There's many of us, but we form one body. It's the body of Christ. Though we form one body, each member belongs to all the others. I belong to you. You belong to me. I need you. You need me. We need each other. That's what Paul is saying. Come down to verse 6. We have different gifts. <laughs> we do. We've learned that the Greek word for gifts is charismata. We have different gifts. I can't expect you to be me. You can't expect you to be me. We've got to be who we are and live with the gift that God's given us. We have different gifts according to the grace. Remember, grace and gifts come from the same root, charismata, charos, given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, no shocker, teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. What is Paul saying here? Make sure that your diakonos, your ministry, flows from your charismata. If it's serving, 
in the name of Jesus, serve. If it's teaching, my Lord Jesus, you better teach. If it's to give a prophetic word, in the name of the Lord, don't hold back. Unused gift equals unmet need. So let me illustrate this, how it works. Let's say it's a church function, and we're going to have a fellowship after church. We're all going to the fellowship hall, and everybody was going to bring pie. And because you know the best pie in the world is pecan pie, because that's what your pastor likes, not pecan pie, pecan pie. That's the best pie. Many bring pecan pie. Some of you brought strawberry pie, some rhubarb, some apple, some pumpkin. I don't know why you like pumpkin, but all right. You bring raspberry, you bring peach, and you all bring your pie. And we're taking our pies to the back room, and on our way back, Marvin's bringing his pie, and he trips, and he drops, God help him, his pecan pie all over the carpet in the ministry center. We have a mess. So someone who flows in the prophetic sometimes has a bit of an edge to them. They might look at Marvin and said, I told you to slow down. That, that, would be, that might be the gift of prophecy right there. If, it, if it's serving, that person might go, oh, let me just go get someone to help you. And I'm just going to do what we can to make this come together. And they just come alongside and serve. If they have the gift of teaching Marvin, they would say to you, I know why you dropped the pie and you tripped. It's because your laces weren't tied the right way. Let me show you how you tie your laces. And, and Marvin, I looked at your pie. You got too many pecans on the right-hand side. And they, 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 they figure it out. They're, they're a teacher. If it's encouraging, give encouragement. The encourager comes alongside and goes, Oh, Marv, it's, don't worry about it, dude. It's going to be all right. These things happen to me too, and they're, they're encouraging you. If they got the gift of giving, they'd say, take my pie. You walk into the kitchen with my pie. You take my pie. Don't worry about it. They, they give you something. If they got the gift of leading, they would look up and say, hey, Kyle, get the mop. Uh, uh, Joe, go to the kitchen and get some paper towels. Uh, Martha, come on over here and see what we can do. They just take over and lead through cleaning it up. Now, I'm going to tell you what usually happens, and I'm going to share with you a story, and it's, it's one of those stories of childhood that I don't need a life group for this. I'm over it, but, but I've never forgot it. I'm in a, I'm in a hamburger place. I'm, I'm all alone. I bought my hamburger. I got my onion rings. I got my chocolate shake, and I'm ready to have lunch, and I'm on my way to the table, and I tripped and my milkshake went everywhere, and my onion rings went flying, and my hamburg splattered on the floor. I like to tell you that someone looked at me and said, well, if your shoelaces were tied, that wouldn't have happened. Nobody said that. I like to tell you that someone walked over and said, let me help you clean that up. That, that didn't happen. I like to tell you that someone came by and put their hand on my shoulder and said, don't worry about it, son. Let me, let me go buy you a new meal. Everybody stared at me, and I bent down, and I cleaned up my mess, and I threw it in the garbage. And the worker stared at me like, tough deal. And I walked up, and I pulled out another $10 bill out of my pocket, and I bought myself another lunch. Turn to your neighbor and go, oh. You know, that happens in church all the time. Something goes on, and people walk out and go, my need was it met? I don't want to be a church of spectators. I want us to be a church that understands what the charismata is in us and let the diakonos flow from it so that the energema would be the God result so that the body of Christ would be built up. Come on, somebody give a little shout of praise in this place. Yeah. I want, to, I want to give you a, a homegrown illustration about the gift of encouragement. I mean, it's right there. If your gift is encouraging, encourage. Last, last Sunday, Saturday night, I go to bed, and I'm going to give you a window into a pastor's life. We should never have a weather app on our phone, just saying. Because I check my weather app before I go to bed Saturday night, and I check, I check the weather app, and they're calling for so much snow. I mean, it's, it's bad. 
and I go to bed, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm worried. No one's going to show up to church. Now, don't judge me, please, for this next line, and please don't send me an email rebuking me. I I'm as human as the next person. I go to sleep, and I'm like, oh, dear God, it's going to be a low offering tomorrow. No one's going to be there. The weather's going to be bad. And sometimes when you show up to church, people go, oh, pastor, it's horrible weather. Do you think anyone will be here? And I just feel more weighted down. I got up that morning, and I checked my phone, and there was a, an email in my inbox from 5.30 in the morning from a guy named Duncan. You don't know Duncan. Duncan was in a church that we pastored some 20 years ago, and he was raw and real, a new believer. He was six foot four, hair down to here, big as can be, raw around the edges, and I would take Duncan on hospital visits in Toronto. I remember the day we're trying to find a hospital in Toronto. I got lost. Don't worry, Pastor. I'll, I'll figure it out. And he walked up to a guy's car, and he pounds on the window to get directions. The poor guy in the car thought he was going to be robbed. I said, Dunk, buddy, you can't do that. You, dude, you look, you look bad, but don't do that. Duncan would come to church every Sunday, even in the winter, with shorts. No socks and sandals. And he'd walk and he'd sit in the front row with his Bible like this, and he'd have his hands up in the air just loving on Jesus. I love Dunk. And he sent me an email. He said, Pastor, God put, me on, put you and Evelyn on my heart. And I've been praying for your name specifically this morning. And I feel God wants me to tell you that your need will be met. And then he signed it the way he always signs his emails. You've got to know Duncan. Let the ghost host. <laughs> Dunk. Last Sunday, you people came. The seniors showed up at 9 o'clock. They said, I don't care if it's snowing, I'm coming. People got saved last Sunday. Come on. About $80,000 came in the offering last Sunday. Oh, me of little faith. I don't know if people know we need the gift of encouragement flowing in the name of Jesus. I said, how many people know we need the gift of encouragement flowing in the name of Jesus? Come on, church. Whoa. All right. Let me give you another illustration before we move on quickly. If your spiritual gift is giving, give generously. Now you're getting real nervous. Oh, I don't want to clap on that one, Pastor. It's a spiritual gift. Now, Mark, is tithing a spiritual gift? Nope. Tithing is obedience to God's word. Come on, I was hoping for a few more amens on that one. I learned as a young child, you give a tenth of what you make to the local church, God will release blessing in your life like you've never experienced. Come on, are you with me today? Do you believe that? He doesn't bless so that I will be blessed. He blesses me so I can bless more. And we as a local church tithe to our district. So tithing is not generosity. Tithing is obedience. But then the Spirit can stir people and put a spirit gift of generosity that they give of resources and of finances. Let me, let me give you a window. And I felt the Lord say to me, I need to tell the church this. We, we built this parking lot, 200 more spots. We need it. $750,000. Are you ready for this? $550,000 since last June is all taken care of. Come on, that's worth celebrating. Come on. Come on. So you do the math. All we need is 200000 more to have it paid off in full. I believe Holy Spirit is going to stir the gift of generosity through you wonderful people. And we're going to have that taken care of in full in 2018. Is there a witness in the house this morning? Come on. Amen? Yeah. Some of you are not praying for that spirit gift. Holy Spirit gives the gift. I've been praying that everybody gets that gift. Yeah. I'm going to give you another window. How many people have heard of Teen Challenge? You've heard of Teen Challenge? Lift up your hand. Heard of Teen Challenge? Started in the 1950s. David Wilkerson's David Wilkerson, city of New York, goes there, starts a ministry to the drug addicts, the gangs, 
It's now worldwide, 80% success rate. People show up, and they're 80% of them walk away drug-free. They are, come on, that's worth celebrating. Come on, that's worth celebrating. So there is a teen challenge coming to the Ottawa Valley. And it's going to happen in an area called Renfrew, and it's going to serve the Ottawa Valley area. And so every year we take on a missions project. Your missions committee have discerned this year it's Missions Canada. And we've designated a Sunday in April. We're bringing guests from Teen Challenge, and we're going to take up an offering, and we're going to sow into Teen Challenge to get that house renovated so that drug addicts can be set free in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, I'm, I'm excited about that. I am excited about that. And you all know that we don't divert our tithe to this. We know that we want generosity to flow above it. I can't wait to see what God's going to do. Let me take you now quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I, I'm going to pick up the speed here, and I'm just giving you some biblical teaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, down to verse 31. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, down to verse 31. Let me read it quickly. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You're like, well, Mark, I've only been a Christian since last Sunday. You're a part of it. Well, Mark, I'm 93 years old. Uh, there's a lady that came in a second service. She celebrated her 92nd birthday in the last couple of weeks, and she comes every Sunday. Come on, I think that's powerful. Come on, that's powerful. Everybody, follower of Jesus, you're part of the body of Christ. Each one of you is part of it. Look at verse 28. God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles. Now, I've got to push pause because I've heard preachers massacre this text. And some have even concluded, well, it says, first of all, apostles. So you know what that means, Mark? That the most important gift is the apostle. No, no. It's not by prominence. It's listed first because that was the first gifting needed for the church to be established. It's not an elevation of prominence. It's an illustration of a gifting needed first. So for the church to start in Corinth, it needed an apostolic anointing for someone to come in and start it. So none of this, the apostle is above the pastor. I had someone when we were pastoring in Bowmanville come up to me and said, I honor you, pastor, but you're just a pastor. The apostle's above you and the prophet's above you. And they took me to the scripture. And I looked at that dear brother in the Lord and I did my best to give them biblical correction and teaching, but they didn't receive it. And I'm just saying to you today, this is not about prominence. This is about what was needed first. God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, their teachers. It says miracles. That means the working of miracles. Then the gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance. Now, the Greek word for guidance is actually administration. Administration. Now, church the gift of administration is as equally spiritual as the gift of prophecy. You better say amen to that. Come on, you better, come on, you better say amen to that. The gift of administration is as equally spiritual as the gift of prophecy. Yeah. Pastor Joe, you know where I'm going. I did it in the first service. If anybody has the gift of administration, this guy's got the gift of administration. And I'm glad. Come on, honor that man. I'm glad that he would function in his spirit gift. Then he says of different kinds of tongues. We'll pick that up in a moment. Look at verse 29. Are all apostles? The answer is no. So everybody say no. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Your, your nose are getting really weak. Come on, I expect you to do better, right from the top, all right? Come on, come on. Are all apostles? No. Come on, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all have gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. Now look at verse 31. This is a verse that Bible preachers have massacred. It says in the NIV, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. 
Well, Mark, you just taught us that every gift is equally spiritual. Now, Paul says we're to desire the, the, the greater gifts. We're to desire the greater gifts. Now, that is a translation from the New International Version, and I want to tell you what it really says. I'm sorry to tell you this. This might, this, might, this. this might change your thinking, and I hope it does. The original language of the Greek doesn't give verse 31 as a command. It actually gives verse 31 as a statement. And it's better translated, you eagerly desire the greater gifts. So in other words, what Paul was saying to the church in Corinth is you've elevated some gifts and you've said some gifts are greater and you are seeking what you feel is the greater gift. You guys hear me today on that? It's not a command to desire a gift that should be elevated. Paul was making a statement to correct the church in Corinth that they were seeking gifts that they thought that were greater than another gift. Let me say it again. All gifts are equally as spiritual. Let me give you some more teaching here. Your spirituality and your spiritual maturity is not demonstrated by the gift of God that manifests through you, but it is illustrated and demonstrated by the fruit of the Spirit that is at work in you. Come on, are you with me today? Sometimes we go, wow, they give a prophetic word. They must be so spiritual. It's the spirit in them coming out. All gifts are equally spiritual. Mark, help me see this a little more. I don't have time to read verse 13 or chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, but 1 Corinthians 13 is all about love. All you need is love, love. All you need is love. Can't believe he sung that this morning in church. I've gone to many weddings where pastors, including me, get up and say, love is patient. Marvin and Esther, love is kind. It does not boast. It holds no wrong. Do you, Marvin, take Esther to be thy wife? If so, please say, I do. Esther, do you take Marvin to be your husband? If, let's just get right to the heart of it. I now pronounce you husband and wife. Marvin, you may now kiss your bride. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Wow. That illustration went a lot better in second service than first service. I definitely picked the wrong person in first service. <laughs> first Corinthians 13, as powerful it is at a wedding ceremony, in its context, it's about the operation of spiritual gifts. Love must flow. We must not envy someone else's spirit gift. We must not boast about the gift that we got. We must not be easily angered when a gift doesn't function the way we think it should function. Pastor, they were so out of order. It was so wrong. Have you ever tried to learn to ride a bike and fall off a few times? I think we need to be a church that gives room for gifts to get better as we learn to function in them. Come on. If you read these verses in Corinthians, and read them this week, have in your mind, not marriage, but spirit gifts. Come on, isn't that good? And love is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Your spirit maturity is not displayed by the gift that functions through you, but by the fruit of the Spirit that is working in you. Ha! Ah, couldn't wait to say that. Let me give you just a couple more closing scriptures. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. I can never find this book real quick. Hebrews James, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and verse 11. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Now, I'm just showing you that that last verse in 1 Corinthians 12 wasn't a command. It was a statement. Now, what I've just read to you is a command. Peter said, each of you should use whatever charismata you've received to serve others. We must not reject the spirit gifts. When you became a follower of Christ, spirit put a charismatic in you, which leads to your diakonos, which brings forth an erogema, and we must use the gift that we've received. Somebody say amen. amen. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Verse 11. If anyone speaks, they should do as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, 
They should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, the power forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. 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 The last thing I want to leave you with is the manifestation gifts. And I want to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 down to verse 11. I want to give you some quick teaching on the manifestation gifts. The first thing comes from verse 7. Paul said in verse 7, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The Greek word for manifestation actually means made clear. Made clear. How many people want to have the clarity of the Spirit in your life? Come on, how many people want the clarity? Come on, you want the clarity of the Spirit in your life? Come on, you want the clarity of the Spirit in your life? I want the clarity of the Spirit in my life, in my household, in my marriage, in our family, and in our church. Paul said, now to each one, the manifestation or the clarity of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now, he lists nine manifestation gifts. To one, there's given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. I love it when the message of wisdom flows. Wisdom is to know what to do by the Spirit. I love when God gives us a wise word for our church, for our lives. We need to ask God to let the gift of wisdom flow. And then he talks about a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. Knowledge, that is a supernatural gift where Holy Spirit shows you something that you don't know in the natural, and you could never know it in the natural. I've shared this story before. It was 1985, and I'm getting ready to start ministry and they took all of us Bible college students to a district conference. And I had some huge pain going on in my body, and I'm freaking out. I'm thinking the big C word. I'm thinking the worst. And I'm in the service, and I'm worried. And a guy gets up, one of our local ministers. He was a senior man. He was leading the service. And he said, I, God just told me that there's somebody here that you walked in, and you've got pain. And he described right where it was in my body. He said, Jesus is going to heal you today. Come on, how many people are glad for that word of knowledge that was flowing? Came forward, people prayed, and Jesus healed. So he talks about the message of wisdom, the, West, the message of knowledge, to another faith by the same spirit. This is verse 9. There can be a supernatural level of faith that God gives you Faith that is way beyond just, just normal godly faith. I mean, you're believing for something that is so big and so... I've had people do that in my life. I mean, we're getting ready to build church, and it's like $9, $10 million, and people are saying, Pastor, I've got the faith to believe that God's going to take care of this, and He's going to raise and release all of the funds, and it's all going to be taken care of. And I'm going, man, I love your faith. I love when that supernatural faith begins to flow. Then he talks about the gifts of healing, verse 9. How many people believe that God wants the gifts of healing flowing in this place? God wants to use some of you to lay your hands upon the sick, and they shall be healed. Pastor Kyle, in between services, came up to me, and he said, Mark, I, I need to tell you what happened Friday night in youth. There was a girl that came to youth on Friday night. She was in a wheelchair. People prayed. She got up out of that wheelchair. She was healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on. Somebody say that. Now, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to share this because, because it illustrates it as well. We're at the altar after first service, and I'm walking around praying for people, and I walked up to one guy, and I remember putting my hand upon him. And I, I just put my hand on hands, but apparently I put my hand right there on his left arm right here. And he pulled me aside after the service and said, Pastor, do you, do you remember when you walked by and you prayed for me? I said, kind of. He said, do you remember where you put your hand? I said, no, I don't. And I got worried, like, oh, what did I do wrong? He said, you put your hand right here. He said, what you don't know is I injured my arm, and I've lost a high percentage of my mobility here. He said, it's not been working well, and you walked by, and you didn't just put your hand there. You said, as you walked by, it's a new day, and God is going to use you. Now, some of you are thinking, well, did he get healed? Did he get healed? Did he get healed? You know what he said to me? The Lord said to me, when you said that, that he's going to use me in ways that might feel like it's my weakness, and he's going to do something great in and through me. Church, miracles come in different shapes and sizes and results. Are you hearing me today? 
Let me read on quickly. He then talks about distinguishing between spirits. It's a spirit gift. It's either from God, from yourself, or from the devil. And sometimes we have a hard time distinguishing if it's from God or ourself. Is it the pizza we had the night before? Is it God, really speaking? Sometimes there's a demonic realm that rises up. I don't want to freak anybody out. It was back in the 90s on a young adult retreat when a young girl after our service, dressed in black, black nail polished the whole bit, I walked over to her and I asked her if she was okay and she pulled a knife out of her purse. She said, I'm going to kill those. And she said a foul word. And I knew right away that this was the demonic and the devil was trying to kill her. And the Spirit of God gave me insight that in my own young self, I could never figure out. I looked at her, and I called the demon by name, and I commanded it to leave in the name of Jesus. I didn't have to shout. I didn't have to scream. And I, I, I mean, who am I? I just looked at her and said, you demon of, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. And a girl that dressed in black was totally set free, got saved, came to church. Hold on came to church Sunday morning dressed in bright yellow. Whomsoever the sun sets free is free indeed. Come on. Discerning of spirits. And then he says different kinds of tongues. The Greek word is glossolalia. And there might be times where someone gives a, a message in an unlearned heavenly language. And it must be accompanied by the interpretation of tongues. The interpretation of the glossolalia. And Paul gives teaching about how this happens in 1 Corinthians 14. I'm just going to say it. We're such a big auditorium. If you feel God's giving you a prophetic word, come to the leadership. Because we will never hear it. But we want to hear it. Now, I want to say something else. Please don't feel that these gifts must only function in a Sunday morning service. I've been praying that they will function in life groups, in Celebrate Recovery, in youth services, in junior high services, in Wow Kids Church, where people lay their hands on the sick and they're healed, and someone gives a prophetic word, someone gives a message in tongues, someone gives an interpretation of tongues. I'm praying that they manifest in connect groups all throughout the week. Church, let's not lock these manifestation gifts into a Sunday morning, one and a half hour service. Let's pray that they're happening all week, every time the church is getting gathering. Come on, somebody say amen. Yeah. And in verse 11, all these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. I want you to stand to your feet for this final scripture. Don't leave. Ushers, block the doors, please. Don't, don't leave, honestly. Love you. Before I read this final scripture, do you remember a few months ago when I shared a dream that I felt the Spirit of God gave me? I've been quiet about it. I had that dream several times. I'm going to tell you again what it was. The Holy Spirit said to me in the last few weeks, Mark, the fruition of that dream is about to happen in this place. I'm in a deep sleep, and I'm picturing the old building of Woodville. And I'm walking through the hallways, and I'm in my dream, and I'm walking through a building that I know so well. And I came to the end of a hallway, and I can't even tell you what hallway it was. It's irrelevant. All I know is I came to the end of a hallway, and there's these big old doors, and they're barred shut. And in my dream, I'm like, really? Where, where do these doors lead to? I don't remember this. And I grabbed the doors, and I pried them open, and they were big, and they were old and heavy. And, and there's a long hallway, and it was dark, and tiles are coming down, and the paint is chipping off, and it's really cold. And I'm walking down and I'm going, where'd this come from? And there's rooms all along the hallway and I'm peeking in the rooms and I'm going, no one told me we had this. We need this space. We need it. 
Where, where'd this come from? We need this space. And I got to the end of the hallway, and I walked into what was larger than a gym, and it was huge. And not so much it was a gym. It was this large room, and I'm walking in going, wow, we need this. And it was old, and it was depleted, and it's like it, it hadn't been used for a long time. But these rooms and this hall and this gym-like looking room had been around for a long time, and, and, it, and it was unused, but it always had been there. And then I woke up. A number of nights later, I went into a deep sleep. And I'm not prone to dreams, but I believe this is a prophetic dream. And I had the exact same dream. I began to sit with people to help me discern it. And I believe the discernment of that dream is those unused rooms that were cold and barred up represents the gifts, the charismata, the spirit that are in this place that have been dormant for years. Oh, I'm going to tell you what the Spirit of the Lord said to me in this last few weeks. The Spirit of the Lord gave me part two of the dream, and it's me running to these doors and opening them up, and you people running behind me, and us running into these rooms and seeing the gifts of the Spirit that have been dormant coming back to life in the name of Jesus. I, uh, I have, I feel so intentional with what I'm about to read to you. In just a moment, I'm going to read to you 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and verse 7. But Paul, Apostle Paul, the groundbreaker Paul, the establisher Paul, was mentoring a young man named Timothy. And Timothy was timid. And Timothy had charismata gifts inside of him. And he had diakonos that God wanted to do through him. And it was going to bring energema results. But Timothy was getting a little afraid. And so Paul said, look at the screen, 2 Timothy 1, verse 6 and verse 7. For this reason, Timothy, I remind you, fan into flame the gift of God. Now the original says, not which is in you. The original says, which is already in in you. <laughs> Come on, did you get that? Which is already in you. Sure, the laying on of my hands. But then he said, for the spirit God gives us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. How many people are raised on the King James Version? Come on, I was there. You, you're going to know it. The King James Version says, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of love, power, sound mind. Holy Spirit showed me this week that the charismata is in every believer in this place. And I will be the bottleneck of what God wants to do, the energema, if I don't pray and help you see the charismata being released from you. And I think what the Spirit has shown me that many of you are fearful. You don't think God can use you. I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too raw. Remember Duncan? Shorts, hairy legs, sandals, long hair. I'm telling you, church, it's time that the charismata, that the Spirit is placed in us, would come to life in the name of Jesus. Come on, are you with me this morning, Woodville? If you want the energema, you got to function in the diakonos, which flows from the charismata, which comes from the Spirit. I believe Holy Spirit wants to fan into life the gifts that are in this house. Every head is bowed, everyone's eyes are closed. Just two things. Before I open this altar, number one, if today was the day that you died and you stepped into eternity, sir, ma'am, young person, adult, do you know that you know that you're going to heaven? Have you personally asked Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior? Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed from youngest to eldest. 
Do you know that you're ready for heaven? I can't close this service without this opportunity. Young man, young lady, sir, ma'am, maybe you've come here for years. Maybe this is the first time you come. Do you know that you know that you know that if today was the day, if you stepped into eternity, that you're going to heaven? If you can't answer that question with a definite yes, but you want to be ready, you want to ask Jesus Christ in your life, you want Him to be the center of your life, you want to be led in a prayer to receive Jesus, I'm going to count to three. And after I count to three, if you want to invite Christ in your life and make Him the center of your life, I want you to lift your hand and I'm going to lead you in prayer. So after I count to three, if you want to make your peace with God through Jesus Christ and enter into a personal relationship with God, I want you to lift your hand. One, two, three. If that's you, that's you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bless your friends. I'm so glad you're here today. Anyone else? Anyone else? You can put your hands down. Anyone else? Oh, I want to lead you in a prayer, friends. And we're going to join you as you pray. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I ask you into my life. Please forgive me my sins. Today I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no going back. I make my peace with you. I receive you in my life. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. I pray this now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, it's party time, Woodville. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, it's party time. Don't go. Don't go. There's one more thing. Before the one more thing, if you accepted Christ in your life on your way out this morning, go to the wall that says follow, and we got a free Bible for you, a free booklet called Follow, and if you don't attend a Bible-believing, life-giving church, how many at Woodville would be honored if they joined us in the journey? Come on, would you be honored? I would be. And if this is your church, get into a connect group. Go to the connect wall. There's the surf wall. And if you're our guest, can we one more time welcome all of our guests? Come on, just let them know. Come on, how glad we are that they came. Make sure you go to our guest lounge. It's just over there. We want to bless you. We want to make a donation to Chi on your behalf and give you a gift card. But church, I'm going to be so intentional and I make absolutely no apologies. I know it's a little over 1230, but I can't close the service without this. I believe that there's literally hundreds of you that you want the charismata that the Spirit has placed in you to be fanned into life and it would lead to your diakonos, your ministry. You don't, you don't want the gift of the Spirit to be dormant. You want the gift of the Spirit that's already in you to come to life so that there would be needs met in and through you. I believe there's hundreds of you you're going to respond right now. If you want the Spirit of God to fan those gifts to life, just like Paul said, stir up the gift. If that's you, come on, come on, come on. Stand at this altar. Come on, come to the front. By coming to the front, you're saying, I want the charismatic gift of the Spirit, whether it's administration, whether it's mercy, whether, 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 whether it's the gift of prophecy or the gift of tongues, whether it's the gift of helps or it's the gift of serving, whatever the gift is, whether it's the apostolic or the prophetic, whether it's the pastor or the shepherd or the teaching. Come on, come on, come on, don't wait. I believe that Holy Spirit is going to fan to life those gifts. And I believe, Woodville, we're bombarding into those back rooms that have been so dormant. And we're saying, Spirit of the living God, bring it to life. Bring it to life. Come on, lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands. Pastor, just lead us in a song as people come. You want the charismata that's already in you to be stirred to life. Come on, front to back, come on. And I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God Sing it again. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of me. Just camp on that line, Brad. Sing it again. I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of me. Do you believe that, Whitvelt? Sing it one more time. I believe in you.
you're standing at the front, just lift your hands as high as you can. I'm just going to pray, and after I pray, I'm going to step off this platform, and I want my pastoral team to come and join me. And we're just going to walk around and pray for you, but I, I, I want to pray that there will be a stirring up of the charismata, of the Spirit that has been placed in you by Holy Spirit. So Jesus, I want to thank you for this amazing church, and I pray in the name of the Lord that you would stir up the gift that's in everyone in this place. I pray in the name of the Lord that the charismata would lead to the diakonos, would lead to the aranagima. I pray in the name of the Lord that there would be a stirring up. I pray that the gifts that you've already placed in these men and in these women would come to life in the name of Jesus, we pray. I pray that the ministry gift, I pray that the motivational gifts, I pray that the manifestation gifts would rise Rise up in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that the spirit of fear would be broken in the name of Jesus. God has not given you the spirit of fear, sir, but a power and love and a sound mind. I pledge you, Woodville, I will do all I can to see you rise up in the gifts that the spirit has already placed in you. I promise you, Woodville, I'm going to do all I can to see a step into a new season. It's a new day. Just like those rooms were by we're barging into those rooms it's a new day so spirit of living God as pastor Brad leads us I'm praying that Holy Spirit would do a powerful work for those that need to go may they go with your blessing we give you praise in the name of Jesus amen amen if you need to go go with God's grace go with God's blessing pastor keep leading us